Welcome back to Reviews with Elaine, because I have opinions. And today's opinions will be about The Library of the Dead by T.L. Huchu. Uh, so this is one of the voiciest books I've read in years, and I spent the entire book thinking that I just want to know more about this world. And slightly problematically, I still do. Uh, so The Library of the Dead follows Ropa, a 14-year-old girl who is just trying to get by and support her family. Uh, it's just her, her younger sister, and her grandmother living in, together in a tiny caravan on the edge of post-failed revolution Edinburgh. Uh, luckily, Ropa is a ghost talker, so she has a good way of making money. Uh, she takes messages from the dead to the living, and hopefully the living pay her for this. She is not running a charity. Uh, she charges a small fee uh, to the people who get the message delivered to them, and when the ghost of a recently deceased mother begs her for help finding her son, who went missing right before she died, Ropa says no. She can't afford to take time off to do an investigation. Uh, she's got to make rent, she's got to buy her grandmother's medicine, she's got to buy her little sister a new school uniform, and who knows what else. But when Ropa tells her gran about this, the kind old lady talks her into taking on the case. Before long, Ropa is searching the entire city, facing gangs she is not in good sides with, uh, evil houses, celebrities, children who have gone through something utterly horrifying, and a mysterious library of magical texts that could help her unlock her magical potential or get her killed. Okay, so I want to start out by saying this book was a home run for me. With Two really big exceptions, and a few small nitpicky things. Uh, so first, I, I even made a short about this, but I did not name the book, because at that point I was not 100% sure that it would continue bothering me throughout the rest of the book. But yeah, uh, so there's a moment exactly halfway through this book, or almost exactly halfway through this book, where a character is giving Ropa a hint of what is going on, and that hint plus the information that she has already gathered and the scene that happens right beforehand, paints such a clear picture of what is going on that I felt like I knew the conclusion to the core mystery of the book at that moment. And I won't go so far as to say that, like, this hint completely ruins the ending of the book or directly maps out the rest of the plot. Uh, there's a lot more going on and a lot more to be discovered than what is covered in that hint. But there was just no question left in my mind who was the antagonist, what exactly they were doing, and at least an idea of how Ropa was going to stop it. And like, I'm all for a bit of good bit of foreshadowing, but this foreshadowing was just a bit too dark and too long of a shadow to cast across the rest of the book. And like, I even would have been fine with all that if it had given Ropa a hint of what was going on. Like if she had spent the rest of the book thinking, I think I know what's going on, but I'm not 100% sure yet. I still need to track down this information. But no, she walks away from the interaction having no idea what's going on. And that really bothers me because she's set up as a very smart person. She is constantly noticing patterns, putting things together. She's reading, she's a very intelligent person. And so it just feels out of character and a bit forced that she doesn't get it at this point. Uh, now that being said, the plot goes basically, it uh, takes a complete left turn from that point. Uh, we're doing some really different things that are related to the core mystery. Like, it, it will get Ropa to that point. And uh, it's stuff that she, like, basically it's stepping stones she's going to have to step on to get to the point. But it's not stuff that was mapped out by that foreshadowing. And so it gives you time to get distracted and think about something else. On top of which, there's a lot of action from this point of the book, straight through to the end, and a lot of emotions that you can focus on instead of thinking, but I know who is doing this. I know what's going on. Uh, so it didn't bother me as much as I was afraid it was going to. And it explains why, at least a good bit of why Ropa didn't figure it out from this point. It's a lot of big action happening. She doesn't have time to stop and think about that one quiet moment. Uh, also, the biggest thing that she is most surprised at about the mystery here, it's, it was the most obvious to me that this is the sort of thing that a reader is going to see as very obvious, but the people in the story are not going to. It makes perfect sense for Ropa not to suspect this particular character. It's sort of like 
when you're watching a movie and the camera like pans very carefully across the gun hanging on the wall, like you as a movie going audience is going to know that that gun is going to be used in the next few scenes. But there's no reason for the characters to know that. That gun is sitting on the wall all the time. Like, this is just a bit of set dressing to them. And that's sort of a big part of what was happening in that scene. It's stuff that, yeah, from an outside perspective, it's very, very obvious. But there's reasons Ropa would not know it. But overall, this entire thing is to say, yeah, there's a bit of foreshadowing in the middle that I feel like it's a bit too clear. The other thing I wasn't perfectly happy with has to do with the climax. And I'm going to try my best not to spoil anything here, but because of that, I'm going to have to use a lot of really vague terms. Uh, so there's a moment when Ropa confronts the antagonist, and the antagonist immediately launches into the traditional join the dark side speech. And it just feels so out of place. First of all, there's almost no reason for the antagonist to think Ropa is the type of person who's going to join them, but also there's no reason for the antagonist to want Ropa to join them, and on top of which, there's no reason for the antagonist to see Ropa as a threat, so it's not like they need to distract her or, like, turn her away from attacking them. Like, there's no reason for this to exist except for clumsy exposition. And that's what it ends up feeling like. It feels like this speech is just clumsy exposition. This is the way for the author to introduce the fact that there is going to be a mysterious, shadowy, big bad that Ropa has to face off in the next couple of books. And uh, for the villain to explicitly state why they are doing what they are doing. And this felt exceptionally egregious to me because, like, that halfway point foreshadowing had already explained to me why the villain was doing what they were doing. And uh, the mysterious big bad has already been name dropped a couple of times in a different couple of different scenes. So it felt like this was all information that I, as a reader, already had. And really what it feels like to me is that either an editor or an agent or an arc reader or somebody in the publication process of this book was like, hey, so I feel like you're being way too subtle with some of what's going on. You need to explicitly state these things. And so the author included this speech where they just directly state what's going on. And it's so unnecessary. I already knew all this. And I don't think I have that much higher of a reading comprehension than most people. I think that this book did not need that. Uh, but beyond that, I love the rhythm of this book. Uh, this book is beautifully staccato, both in plotting and in prose. The scenes tend to be very short, very sharp, and feel somewhat disparate. Like, there are a good number of scenes that are literally just character and world building. Uh, little slice of life moments within Ropa's existence. Like, there's a scene where she's just baking with people. And they are not progressing the plot. They're not, like, building... They're building an image of what the world looks like and what Ropa looks like. But otherwise, they don't really have a strong purpose. And I love that. It felt real and authentic, and like she was just going through her day. And also, uh, on a purely simple level, I appreciate the fact that she is a character that is poor and can't just set aside her job to do other things. So we get to see her just doing her job. And even once we get to the part of the book where every scene does have to be progressing the action forward, every scene is narratively fraught, uh, even then the scenes tend to be relatively short, relatively sharp, we don't get a lot of filler between the scenes. Uh, like, we get almost none of what I think of as the elision when an author writes, over the next couple of weeks, Ropa got to know this, or whatever, that sort of thing. We don't have much of that. We generally just jump straight from one important moment in an important scene to the next important moment in another important scene. Uh, on top of that, the language is very staccato. We get a lot of short, sharp sentences. Uh, we get a lot of sentences with implied subjects, as well as a lot of descriptive phrases punctuated like sentences. Uh, so for example, on the first page. So here we go. It's been a long day. Super long. Hiked up the B702 all the way up to Liberton, doing my deliveries, and swung back around the bypass, last stop, Larnark Road in Juniper Green. So you'll see that even when there are long sentences, there are a lot of punctuated phrases within it, which gives it that sharp, pulsing rhythm, which 
feels fast and feels quick and like it's going somewhere, but there's also a feeling of a bit of aggression to it, which really fit the book's voice. And I already mentioned that this book is super voicey. The voice is what I absolutely loved about this book. Next time someone asks me for an example of a really voicey book, like this is the one I'm going to pull out and be like, this is what I mean when I say a book is voicey. Uh, besides the staccato rhythm, there's also an easy and elegant combination of slang, philosophical language, and a feeling of youth to the language. Ropa is very intelligent, listens to like audiobooks on complex non-fiction topics constantly, and is often making connections between what she reads in her life. Uh, she explains complex mathematical concepts in, to the reader in the same paragraph where she jokes about putting on math goggles and getting super scholarly. Uh, she's rude. She makes sometimes inappropriate jokes. Uh, she is snarky when she's in danger and mixes slang that feels like it comes from a dozen different places and times and eras. Uh, she references old TVs and movies. Overall, I think this book perfectly captured the voice of a teenager who is very smart, lives in a very dangerous environment, and was forced to grow up far too soon. And because this book is first-person POV, there is no question that the voice of the book is Ropa's voice. And that's great. It really invests you in the character. But there are a couple of downsides. Uh, one is that Ropa is actually very young. She is directly stated to be 14, which makes her casual use of phrases like kiss my vag and her, prep, uh, her being propositioned by a sex worker, it's just a bit uncomfortable. And like she is shown as a character who is comfortable with the existence of sex. And that's fine. 14 year olds often are, but as an adult reading it, it just feels a little bit like, okay, okay. Uh, and like, uh, there's also Priya, uh, so I may be wrong here, and it may be because Ropa sounds older than she is, but I read Priya as a possible love interest for Ropa. And Priya is 19. And, like, maybe I'm reading something into it that's not actually there, but particularly there's this one moment when they're in an action scene and Ropa is sitting in Priya's lap for reasons, and Priya comments in passing that Ropa smells nice, and Ropa responds with that's just her natural scent, and this all feels very flirty to me, and so because of that, this scene colored the rest of their interactions for me, and it really felt like are they flirting? Are they being a couple? Are we developing them to a couple? And I would like them together. They're really cute together. Except for the fact that, you know, Ropa is 14. Like, even if Priya was 17 and Ropa was 16 or, like, just somehow brought them closer together in age, I wouldn't have mind. But 19 and 14 do not feel like acceptable love interests to me. The other problem with being so completely in Ropa's voice is that she doesn't do a lot of pure explaining. Uh, she has a lot of moments of philosophizing on the way the world works, on history, on the physical descriptions of the world around her, but otherwise we don't get much. Uh, small spoilers here, but by the end of the book, I still don't know if magic has always been part of this version of the world, or if it was a secret before. Uh, and if so, when did it become widely known slash when did it come into existence? Uh, I don't know what exactly happened in the cataclysm that so drastically changed Scotland. I don't know if this was just Scotland that went through this cataclysm, or if it's all the British Isles, or if it's all the world. I don't know exactly what the government status is. Like, I got the impression there's something fascist going on here, but I don't know. I don't know how magic interacts with the government, slash the government interacts with magic. And the thing is, it doesn't feel like there's a gap in the world building. It feels like I'm just not being let into the information. I could tell the author had thought through these questions and has answers for them, but is just choosing not to give up the information? Uh, the book is a bit like you're standing at a closed window where you can see into the rooms, but it's not letting you wander about the rooms as you will. And this is one of those things that I sort of assume will get a lot more information on the world in book two and book three, but I do feel a bit hungry for more having just finished this one. 
and I can't quite decide if this is the kind of hungry for more that is just like, oh, it's prodding me to buy the next book, or if I'm actually feeling just actively unsatisfied with the ending of this book. Uh, but the elements of world building that are here and are explored are some of my favorite elements of this book. Uh, everything from the realms of the dead was absolutely fabulous, both in the way it works and the physical descriptions. This is one of the few times that the author did give us a good amount of straightforward physical description. And it's cool and atmospheric and sort of horrific. There are three or four moments in this book that really feel like the book is drifting slightly more into the horror genre and out of fantasy. And a couple of them relate to this, you know, world of the dead. And the descriptions are so clear and evocative and disturbing and like, it's rare that I find something I read in a book actively creepy, and there are moments in this book that I found actively creepy. Uh, but also, this is where we get a little bit more exploration of the kind of things that magic can do in this world, and it's all really fascinating and interesting and fabulous, and a great mix of the familiar and the, to me, unfamiliar. Also, the characters, almost across the board, are strong, interesting, and carefully painted. Uh, now, some of them are painted in broad strokes, like the landlord character is one that is flat as a pancake, but he doesn't need to be anything more round. And what more, even these flat characters are interesting uh, and often somewhat metaphorical. They are clearly set up as metaphors, but the main characters here are fun and interesting uh, to hang out with. Like, I enjoyed spending time with them. I was a bit nervous on page one that I wasn't going to like Ropa because she puts on such a show of being a business-minded, hard-as-nails, sassy, wise-ass, but it only takes around, like, one chapter to see that that is expertly balanced with a deep sense of empathy and longing. Uh, Priya is fun and has some really interesting layers. Uh, Ropa's basically two mentors, like she has two characters that are basically her mentors, and both of whom, they're clearly going to be guiding her from like opposite sides of a balanced perspective. Uh, and like, I liked all of that. The only character I feel that was a little bit underdeveloped was actually her best friend Jomo. Uh, he sort of comes across as the character who just exists to get Ropa into the right place at the right time. But then he keeps coming back into the narrative, and she thinks about him the way uh, that feels like he is a major character. But if you were to ask me to describe him, all I'd probably be saying is he's amicable, he likes Ropa, probably in a non-romantic way, he's a bit goofy, and that's all I got. Like, I don't know anything else about him. But I mean, this is book one of what is clearly going to be a continuing series. So, like, I feel like, of course, we're going to get to know him more later on. It's just, he didn't get much in this book. Overall, I just really liked this one a lot. It was fun, action-packed, had some fabulous, playful prose. It's got a fascinating world, fun, likable characters, and a lot of potential for development. I think this is a great start to a series. And overall, the feeling that I got walking away from this book was, okay, but I want more. So I'm definitely interested in book two, uh, though I do wish we'd just gotten a bit more of that more in book one.